Welcome on, Pepperhausen. Welcome, my friend. Thanks. It's, it's an honour to be on, actually. It is. It's, uh, yeah. Long time listener, first time on, so love it. Have it's you actually happening. been a listener? I've been a listener. Yeah. How did you find the show? Uh, probably just through just trying to find things that I like. And, yeah. Uh, a few good guests on and um, thought I'd listen to it and then sort of just become like a weekly thing and wow there you go man that's unbelievable that means a lot <laughs> um what episodes have you listened to um, like your favorite my favorite ones. would be emma murray I reckon, yeah for man, sure she was unbelievable um and i was going through sort of that time there as well where i was um sort of find, trying to find a podcast like it and um yeah everything she sort of speaks about and um after playing golf with a few of the richmond boys too she's obviously there helping them out and um, that's a few things before so yeah, it was easy listen and um yeah, you can use it in all aspects of life so oh mate she's yeah. the, she's the best she's honestly my favorite favorite person on the show and like i say it i might say this a bit but i say it sort of selfishly like i love getting her on to like have her on the show but i love just having her on to just talk to her yeah like, i feel like it's like a one-on-one like session just by <laughs> herself so i forget we're even recording yeah pick her brain yeah no that was, that was a really good listen so it's probably t- that's probably my top you're ready everywhere you're doing everything. I love it. I love go-getters. I love people that do shit and just try shit and you everywhere. You're obviously dominating for the storm. Can't wait to hear a lot about that story. You're playing golf. You've got a crypto dead diamond society business. You've got a like a Gatorade type drink <laughs> going. I don't know. There's a lot of other things going, but I can't wait to unpack it all today. How do you find the time? Yeah, that's the thing really. it's um, There's a lot going on, but um, I like being busy and um, there's a few different things and um i don't really have time to be honest i'll yeah. finish footy and uh if there's still daylight i'll head out to the golf course and and if not i'll head into we've got an office in south melbourne and um just do some work there so i really only go home to sleep but um <laughs> yeah, it's not a good thing because i'm also ordering food all the time and it gets pretty expensive but um yeah i just i've always been a big believer in having a life after footy and mm. um mum and dad sort of instilled that into me when i was a kid and um now we're just really lucky to have that opportunity that we can sort of network and, and be in positions where we can do other things and um, where we have time to do other things. So that's sort of how I look at it. Mate, it's really admirable because I think when I was playing sport, like I probably got forced to do that and like network because I knew it was, you know, time was sort of ending. And sometimes you see a lot of players like when you're as good as you are and when you're, you know, actually a dominant player in the game, it's really hard to focus on other shit because you've got so much going on at the time, like actually being at the top of your game as well, like finding the balance. So yeah, it's weird that you've been able to sort of, not weird, but it's, it's awesome that you've been able to do both. Yeah, it's it's, it's quite, it's a bit of a catch-22 because like I I find I play my best footy when i am got other things to do outside of footy. Yeah. Um, and then when I actually rock up on the day or, or rock up to training and we have to sit down and do two or three hours of video, I'm concentrated for that two or three hours. Whereas um, there'd be some other guys in the league that go home and just, think about footy and just review their games but i feel like i do my best work when i'm present at training and, and present at the game and um yeah i can sort of fill my mind with other things when i'm off the field yeah it's interesting super interesting it's it's, it's I, I don't think there's many people like it to be honest so it's very um very exciting <laughs> let's um talk your story now obviously i'm from melbourne you're playing for the melbourne storm you're a sydney boy league isn't the biggest game in melbourne or in victoria do you like that? Yeah, I, I think so. And it's probably what we sort of pride ourselves on as yeah. a club really is the guys that first come down here in 98 um, would probably get laughed at. Uh, rugby league coming to a town, it's predominantly footy. Um, and I think that's sort of what we sort of have a bit of a pride about now is although it's it's still not recognised as the number one game in Melbourne, I've just figured out Victorians just love successful sporting teams yeah. and you just want to buy into that and and train hard and you're just motivated for that through that sort of thing so although it's not a rugby league town um it still gets a lot of respect and um we still get plenty of people at our home games which is cool but the big thing's probably the media side of things you, you're not getting hassled for walking down the street mm. or i think people are just used to having sports people around melbourne so it's not like you get hassled or um, anything like that so it's all it's good that you're low-key and you're away from everything but um there's also that sort of i guess bit of pressure that you, you sort of got to <laughs> be a good footy side otherwise um that'll be pretty easy to jump off love it i love what you said about um melbourne being supportive i think we're just very good at bandwagons like we're <laughs> very very strong at bandwagons in this state i tell you now it's it's very strong especially you see the demons going well at the moment um league though your journey i'd love to go into it because there's so many different things that i'm sure a lot of people are aware of but even today like when we're sort of planning for this episode and like the contrast between your journey going to league and like a young guy 
going to AFL. It's so different. Yeah, like 100%. league, there's no drafts. There's no, um, you know, like draft camps. It's it's so different. Like you can actually sign with teams and get into different spots and it's such a contrary like place to actually work. Talk us through your story firstly of how you actually ended up at, at the Storm. Yeah, it's, it is quite different. But um, yeah, so I sort of started out like any other kid, uh, just played rugby league growing up and uh, <clears throat> loved it. Played sort of every Saturday, went into high school. Um, my high school was a rugby union school. So that changed to Saturday, had to find a league team that played on Sundays. And I did both through that. Um, then sort of went through that pathway, um, enjoyed my footy, got picked in a few rep teams. Um, and then that's sort of where I landed at the West Tigers in Sydney. And that was sort of my first exposure to a semi-professional environment. And um, and is that on the list? Like, Yeah, so I was in the under 20s. So yep. it would sort of be, yeah, like you're not on the list, but you're yep. sort of just under it. And um, sort of just, I guess it'd be like the TAC Cup. I don't know what they call it yep. now, but... Um, yeah, sort of the equivalent to the 18s and um yeah you try to play footy there and um i guess for the for the afl it's you're sort of playing to be picked in the draft whereas league is sort of just playing to be picked up by the time your contract finishes so yeah. i would have signed with the tigers when i was 15 or 16 for two or three years um and then so at the end of that contract um that's when the storm approached me so yeah. How league contracts work are 12 months out from when your contract finishes, you can start actually, you can sign with another club, which that's so weird. Which is yeah. strange, really strange, but that's sort of what happened. And um, I had a few injuries through 20s, so there was only really probably West Tigers and Storm that offered a contract. Um, Storm offered something, Tigers matched it. Yep. Um, and Storm are renowned for making really average plays into pretty regular first graders and... Um, that was sort of the appeal. Um, the appeal was Billy Slater, Cameron Smith, Cooper Cronk, Craig Bellamy, all those big names. They were the attractions to me. And um, I just, I, I really wanted to play footy. I didn't know if I'd ever play NRL, but I thought if I was to, it'd probably be the best decision to go down there. And um, yeah, with mum and dad's blessing, they sort of sent me off and um, yeah, sort of said, we believe in the system down there and we really think you can, you can, crack it and if you really want to do it then then jump and, and take that take that leap and um so it's funny like it wasn't a draft it wasn't anything like that i just come off contract and yeah. storm sign me and um yeah come down here to to do a pre-season and um yeah i didn't know what i was coming into but yeah it's it's quite strange because like i look at if they were to pick a draft when i was 18 i'm not first round i'm not second round i'm you know what i mean like i'd yeah. probably get overlooked <laughs> whereas like i got thrown i got people obviously seen something in me and brought me into a good system where I could thrive and um yeah here I am today so I'm really fortunate for that but um yeah I don't know what I would have done if it was a draft I probably wouldn't have been picked and oh, yeah. yeah I haven't thought about it like that there actually is pros and cons of both like I thought like a draft is always good because it's even for the competition and it gives like players a chance but you're right like sometimes if you haven't had a good you know under 18 year or under 20 year and you don't get the chance to actually go into a club and play and go into a good system, you don't really perform and you don't do it. Because it's the opposite. Yeah. Some top 10 picks can't cut it once they actually get onto the list. Yeah. And it's like, I look back and sort of the guns around my age when I was sort of 18, 19, there's probably a few that played first grade when they turned 18 or turned 19. Mm. But out of the top 10, there's probably only three. Wow. So, um, yeah, it's, it's quite crazy to look back on. But... Uh, at the same time it's yeah there's a really good system down here at the storm and um yeah they sort of just prove time after time that they can um yeah really change change players and, and make you into regular first graders and um, yeah, i'm just just grateful i sort of made that move and, and chose to move down here yeah, that's awesome now the league um obviously this is going to league supporters will be cringing me saying this but to give context in this you're leading the Dally m at the moment <laughs> which is super exciting in itself that's a conversation that i want to get into because it's again very different to the brown law and how that gets you know like shown throughout the year but to go from a player that you're saying probably wouldn't have got picked up in a draft moving to the storm and becoming winning the Dally m like it's pretty unreal isn't it like when you think about it yeah it's it's obviously nice to be leading that at the moment but um I think the whole journey's probably been a bit of a crazy one in terms of my first year down here. I knew I probably wasn't going to get a go. I was probably the fourth string fullback. Um, was it behind Billy Slater? Billy Slater, yeah. Jerome Hughes, which is now our halfback, and Scott Drinkwater, who's um, moved clubs now. But I was sort of sitting behind them and um, just training hard. And 
we travel up to Queensland every week and, and play footy. Our, our reserve grade side was up in Queensland. And so we'd do that for the first year, um, come back. And then it wasn't until 2019, um, one of the boys went down with an injury in the preseason. I think Billy Slater retired. One of the boys went down with an injury in preseason. Um, and then I think there was another injury. So I got an opportunity and um, got to play maybe half a trial and loved it, frothed it, thought I was like, thought I was the man. <laughs> got to put a Storm jersey on, was stoked at that moment. This wasn't my first game though. This was like a trial, so it doesn't really count. Um, and then it wasn't until round four or five that I actually got an opportunity off the bench. So for those who probably don't know rugby league, but um, <laughs> very foreign position, um, it'd be probably sort of going up playing in the midfield and then them just sticking you down back um, and just go and try your best. Um, so that's sort of what I was doing my first few games of my career. And um, when I talk about a really good system, this is just sort of an example of it. They gave you just re three really simple things to focus on during a game. And if you did that, you'd be picked each week. Mm. So I had a really simple plan going into a game and that was play tough, um, be involved and uh, just limit your errors. So I went into a game just thinking that. And um, funnily enough, a couple of weeks later, the guy who was playing fullback after the injury, after the other injured bloke got injured. So I got to start in that position and um, <laughs> it was crazy. It was like my breakout game, one or two games in at that position. And um, I just thought like all that sort of work you've done beforehand and learning behind all these guys. And now I've got this opportunity to play fullback and um, fast forward to this year where I've played nearly 70 NRL games. Uh, I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but um, that's sort of where I'm at. And um, they've sort of got that position locked down at the moment, I think, but um, it's pretty crazy to look at the last two years and sort of the steps it's taken and um, yeah, sort of what we've been able to do. Yeah. It's, like I, I can't say I know, I know you sort of played off call, but to think like to come in as a young kid and fill that position as fullback when you know even I know who Billy Slater is and you know Cooper Cronk and these sort of guys that have been you know the, at, at the Storm, how was it as easy as that or was it there was there parts where like you actually self doubting that you'd be able to sort of fill in in that shoe or did they make it pretty yeah, easy for you? Not at all. Hey, yeah, like yeah. that's probably that's probably the most common question asked yeah. is well, asked when I was sort of going to play was how are you going to fill these shoes mm. and I was like. Billy pretty much fills them for me. He gives me everything he learned. Like he still comes into this day and tells me what he's looking for. He'll watch games and give me feedback. And like he, there was nothing he was protecting. It was nearly like he was daring me to go be better than him. Like that was the sort of vibe that I was getting from him. And um, there was no pressure. It was, it was, he reassured me, you just do you. Um, you're obviously good, good enough to make this footy side and, and the coach has picked you for a reason. So like go out and play your footy. You don't have to be me. You don't have to do this. Oh. But here's all this information that might help so that was sort of my exposure to playing first grade and um i was just really lucky that we're in a i was in a really good side um storm have been sort of up there for a, a few years now and um always been successful and i think that what they do really well is just everyone buys in the whole team buys in and um the guy who comes into the system just does your job and if you do your job you'll, you'll stay you keep your spot in a team every week so um I think I was, it's, it's all very lucky that I sort of got to the storm and then once I had that opportunity, um, yeah, I had all the resources to help me out mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I felt really comfortable from the get-go. Super crazy, man. Like you think of, you know, in any sport, the older, maybe veteran that's there and you have those like young players that are coming, often, you know, it's not treated like that. Like there's, and I'm sure at a lot of clubs, it's, it's the same thing. You know, they don't nearly want to have their spot challenged, but to have someone like, Billy Slater, it's not surprising. Like I've never heard that before, but it's it's not surprising really. Like that yeah. he was doing that. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's and I think that's sort of because those guys first come to the club when it started, and um, they only want success for the club too. They know that um, Melbourne's an AFL town, and um, they want to be successful. They want to see their team be successful, and they put in all this hard work to be on the map and to be recognised. And um, yeah, I just I think they just don't want it to see that go down. So they're always in helping and. Um, we've got, we got a really strong connection to our old boys and a lot of the old boys come back and say the same thing um, that when they went to another club they immediately wanted to come back they missed the storm wow. they missed the culture they missed um, how the young guys were treated they missed they missed everything about that and I think being a young guy sitting in those seats listening to them sort of hear that when it comes to negotiation time with me re-signing I'm like like I want to stay here like this yeah. is this is this is a grouse this is what I love and um, I'm able to play my best footy here, so 
It's a pretty special club. It's awesome. We've heard so much about um, one person, especially in the league, like Craig Bellamy. You, like I hear about him all the time and just so revered as like a coach and not just league, but in, in general. What's he like and what's he been like for you? Yeah, he's he's certainly changed sort of when I first got there. Um, <laughs> it's funny, he's, you obviously see all the, uh, the blow-ups he has in the box and um, the sort of way he goes about things, but... Uh, I think the last few years have been quite refreshing because you see his you see his grandkids come in and mm. um, <clears throat> when you sort of see that side of him, you sort of understand that he's just passionate about what he does and um, he holds really high standards. But I think a story that really reflects Bells is just um, when he first got to the club, he ran the tan with the boys. He'd win the tan versus all the boys. And, and to this day, he's the first one in the gym. So mm. you get there at six in the morning, he's in the gym lifting weights. He probably shouldn't be lifting. He's getting old now, but... <laughs> He's grinding, he's lifting weights um, at six in the morning. And then when you leave at five in the afternoon, he's in his office cutting videos. And so it's sort of that whole thing around first one there, last to leave. And if your coach is working that hard, then you have no excuse. And mm. I think that's just Craig. Um, he, he, like I said, he has really high standards. Uh, doesn't ask too much of you. Um, he's really big about effort. And if you, you don't put in effort, you're not going to last long. But um, yeah, that's, that's sort of his mantra. If you're not going to give something 100%, then... Why are you doing it? Love it. It's, <laughs> I suppose that would tie into another world famous thing that we hear about at Storm is these preseason camps. <laughs> what are they called? Is it the uh, I don't quit camp? I don't quit camp. That fucking gives me anxiety <laughs> thinking about it. What what takes place uh, on these camps? Yeah, so uh, not a lot of sleep, a lot of physical activity, and uh, borderline borderline abuse. I'd call it. <laughs> it's uh it's it's not a fun trip but one that once again like everyone at the storm's done it yeah. so there's always that story even when the old boys come back you're telling yarns about like what went on at your idq camp and the whole thing is like it's just three grueling days of no sleep your yeah, food's limited mm. yeah walking x amount of kilometers a day and um yeah the instructors pretty much just give it to you you do something positive they'll just find something negative and just try try really get into you and i think the whole concept around it is when you're at your most fatigued your true character comes out um and that's sort of what craig's really big on and and that's why he's continued it since he's been here but um yeah just three three massive days of um (laughs) yeah no sleep and you sort of just got to you're in your little teams and you got this bar to carry and just everything you can think of packed into three days but um it sort of gets really tough between the last couple you sort of know that the end's nearing, but because you haven't slept and doing these activities, by the last night, yeah, like we do this thing called, um, oh, what do you do? It's like you stand out in the bush for, it's the last thing you do, like six hours. They don't, you don't know the time. You actually don't know the time. They don't give you a watch. No, they mess no. with the bus times. So like when you're trying to get transported to different places, you don't know what's going on. So I'll just say, when it started going dark, <laughs> they put these glow sticks on your bag and they go, all right, you walk around this guy's farm, don't talk, no running, just pure walk. Sweet, easy. You're walking, you count a 30 second lap, you just keep going around and like, when's this thing gonna end? So you count, you count, you count, and it goes full dark and then they go, all right boys, bring it in. Um, have a bottle of water, um, here's your up and go. Hop on the bus, you, we're taking you somewhere. So you get on the bus, look at the time. <laughs> I'm guessing like maybe nine, 10 o'clock. Like, it's dark, it's been dark for a few hours. On the bus, they drop you off. They go, all right, follow us. So there's about 12 of us. You follow this instructor in one line. Every two, 300 meters, he drops one person off and goes, all right, stand here. If you see someone, if you see a dog, if you see a wild animal, scream, halt, who goes there? That's the only information you're given. Don't fall asleep. Um, don't sit down. You have to stand. They're your only instructions. Go, go, go. I think I was maybe the 10th dropped off. Um, and you hear all these stories about like the year before how this is this is what you're going to do this is the big one like this is the big test like this is strap yourself in for this so the whole thing is you stand there overnight until the sun rises <laughs> on guard after two days no sleep so you're just standing there like you like I said halt who goes there after two days of no sleep you forget what word he told you to say oh so my. like we're standing there in the middle of the night and like we'll see an instructor walk past and because you're awake and you've got to say something like you're screaming like halt uh and like don't know what to say so they just get into you they'd rip into you 
I reckon there was probably two or three times I asked what I need to say. And it wasn't until like a year later when the new boys went that I remembered Fuck. what it was. So you stand in the dark. It was raining. It was pouring. Um, we had our ponchos on. And because you're so on edge and like me personally, I'm a pretty like, I don't want to get in trouble. I'm sort of straighty 180 yep. and <laughs> like, like, like be really switched on here. And like every pitter patter of rain, I would scream something out because I thought it was an instructor walking past. So I was like paranoid and um, probably towards the end of it was... Like I'd never experienced anything like it. Like I actually started hallucinating. Wow. Um, like balls, like there's a, there's a tree in front of me. Uh, I looked like a clown juggling balls and I'll never forget it because <laughs> I thought it was a clown juggling balls. And I was just staring at this thing. Next minute, thunderstruck. And like, you know when it like thunders really bright that just lights up the whole sky? Yeah. That's when I realized it wasn't a clown juggling balls. I was like, fuck, I'm standing in the bush again. Like get your head on, like get, like, get fixed. <laughs> What's going on? And then it wasn't until maybe half hour after that, that, standing up again starts raining again and i just remember like bang i just hit the deck so i'd fallen asleep standing Standing up up. so that's how fatigued i was but like there were guys who had it probably worse off than me but that's like the last big test um (laughs) from that so i remember once they come and collect us in the morning like they tell you you did a good job that's probably the only rap they give you yeah um but we went from there onto a bus and you pretty much go back to amy park where we first started and um this is probably what highlights it all so we go to an army camp on the way back home to do like a little course through mud and all those sort of things and i remember getting on the bus from there to this um course we're going to and um gee would have probably been felt like a 15 minute car trip um and i remember getting off and we got strapped and um, had to get our feet strapped again because it was wet and everything like that. And I remember just turning to Harry Grant, who was next to me, and I go, oh, like, how hard was that? He goes, yeah, like standing out in the bush for like six hours and all this sort of stuff. I was like, no, 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 like what we just did then, like we moved the log off the road. He goes, what are you on about? I go, like we just moved the log off the road like before we got here. He goes, no, we didn't. So I must have fallen asleep <laughs> on the bus on the way there. Turned out to be like an hour and a half trip, but I thought it was a 15 minute trip. And, and you, didn't get off off. The road. you didn't get off. Nah, <laughs> I didn't get off the bus. The bus didn't stop, but like it literally felt like 15 minutes. I had a dream that we moved the log off the oh, road. You had a... I had a micro sleep on the bus. Oh my God. And it took an hour and a half to get to the next place to do this other thing. And I thought it was 15 minutes. Fuck. <laughs> so you were just apt. I thought you fell asleep while they were moving the log. No, and you, it you didn't moved. happen. It yeah. didn't even happen. Like, so that's, that's sort of where He's I was using at. all sorts. I was cooked i'd probably slept for another three four days after do, that do you actually look back because I, I look back on i've never done a camp that you know extreme but you look back and actually you enjoy it and you you learn a lot from it oh, like, i I'd, i wouldn't want to do it again but it's something that i've done now i'm like i feel like i'm a part of the storm because i've done yeah, this and okay. everyone else has done it yeah and there's probably there's, i really like you'd really test yourself out like i don't i doubt i'll ever be in that situation again but mm. I'm really proud that I did it. And um, yeah, it's, it's a story to tell. And um, that like, none of that is a lie. That's pure truth and pure what I went through. And um, that's probably only one tenth of the stories that you could probably tell from that camp. Fucking hell. <laughs> um, I think that every probably person that's in elite sport gets to that stage um, of when you're so tired and when you're so in so much pain and you're doing like any activity, you get to a stage where you're actually in so much pain that you can't go in any more pain. No. So it's sort of like you just, you can just sort of like stay there. It doesn't get any worse. It was the first time I reckon I've lost, like literally lost my head and like could not control it. But yeah. Yeah. It, you nailed it on the head. Like there's, when you, when you sort of get into the nitty gritty of sport, nothing quite compares to what you did at that Jesus camp. So Christ. it just makes everything a bit easier. Yeah. No, I <laughs> didn't go in that camp. So I can't, um, can't really talk there, but that sounds fucking full on. Um, this year, mate, talking about your game in itself, you're like, and, I don't hope you don't mind me saying this, but you're, how tall are you? 180? 181? 183? No, let's say 182. 182, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know us, us short the kings. The under six foot club, yeah, I'll us, say that. Yeah. Short kings like to know. It's, it's very, we get pedantic on our height. But you're, for a league player, like a smaller guy. Yeah, yeah. I'd probably be one of the smallest. Yeah, probably top three smallest. Yeah, top three smallest. Yeah. Do, you, do you have to do similar training or are you more focusing on like your role of fullback like actually agility running carrying like because i love watching you play because it's like you get to do all the cool shit and none of the bad like you don't have to do much of the yeah. like, really bad things i think i make up for that in the preseason. it's um our pre-seasons are pretty ruthless they're, they're renowned for that but um 
you get looked after in the season more. Yeah. I reckon you sort of do what's specific to your position, but in preseason, it's... Um, You're doing it all. Free for all, yeah. Mm. Tackling the biggest blokes in the side. Um, they run as hard as, at you as they can and um, probably get it worse off in preseason. You're doing MAS and you're doing it a bit further than the other blokes. So, um, physical side of things, yeah, everyone's yeah, sort of free for all and um, the sort of aerobic side of things is they sort of split you up and do what you need to do to, to be ready for the season. Love it. Um, biggest thing that we, we love watching is obviously State of Origin. Yet to make debut of reasons being there's a few different reasons is it on the cards is this year yeah I, I think so it's um it's probably something i really wanted to play as a kid and sort of as i've come through the system now it's it's an awesome achievement to make it and everything but um i just love footy with the storm like i just yeah. like you know what i mean i feel really valued at the storm and um i don't really feel any pressure to be playing in those those sides or anything so although it'd be nice and although it's something i dreamt of as a kid it's and it's a massive um one of australia's biggest sort of sporting events um i haven't really put too much thought into it but i think at the end of the day it's the old cliche you, you play good footy you sort of get picked in those sides anyway so yeah. um they haven't really stressed too much about it but um yeah, it's a massive massive occasion and um, i remember yeah watching as a kid and and wanting to put that jersey on so um yeah, hopefully this year, but not too much pressure on me. Love it. We'll be, we'll be, we'll be there. Um, one of the reasons being, I think, last year what you missed was with the concussion. Yep. So, big knock last year that uh, you spent 10 weeks. Yeah, 10, 10 weeks. 10 weeks on the yeah. sidelines. Like, are you happy to talk us through that? Like, what yeah. happened? How how are you feeling? Yeah. How are you feeling since? Um, yeah, it was, pretty, it was a pretty scary one, I think. Um, sort of got a concussion uh, and symptoms just didn't get better for... Yeah, nearly ten weeks, and um, what we what we experiencing? Uh, the first few weeks, I was just I was just completely not myself. Like, couldn't get out of bed, um, headaches, sort of feeling sick, like just all those sort of things, mm. and um, like real sensitivity to light and noise. And um, I was pretty much just a shell of myself. Like, you couldn't really talk to me without okay. um, like I'd just get real agitated and probably have a two minute conversation, and then just doze off and want to do my own thing so um that was the first few weeks um pretty scary um and then sort of after that i just thought like you have this thing in mind that it'll just get better and um you got to do nothing and it'll just get better but um probably had the reverse effect on me to be honest i didn't do anything didn't do gym didn't run um, pretty much just sat in bed and got up for a walk and mm. um, that was literally all i did for eight weeks after that until we sort of met with some specialists and they said just get active, work your heart rate up, and um, we'll see where we go from there. And that wasn't until the back end of the season that I started feeling a bit more better in uh, my body and um, like coming back from that. And then we sort of figured out I had a few neck issues as well. So although the sickness and um, feeling foggy had gone, I still had headaches from like a really tight neck. And um, since then, it's probably been a bit of a blessing in disguise because I've done a lot more work now and um, we've got all these little apparatuses from the UFC and everything that we can mm. sort of work our neck on and um yeah it's been really good since so touch wood but um yeah it was pretty scary last year and obviously sort of missed origin and probably wasn't myself throughout um the rest of the season so um yeah got to build some confidence back up this pre-season and uh yeah, everything's been going well so far how hard is it with with like concussions and stuff and you know, i've spoken to so many footy players about this too and you you sort of feel like not not embarrassed but you sort of feel it's not an injury where you can just put some tape on it. No. Like you can't, when someone rocks up to the club and they're on crutches, you know they're injured. Yeah. But when someone's got like a concussion, it's so hard, you feel guilty nearly in a way because yeah. you're like, oh, like I'm here, I'm right, but I'm not. Yeah. And you could probably tell that the first few weeks. Like you could probably tell like if there was crutches for a head injury, you could probably just talk to me and figure it out. Yeah. Like, whereas it was probably the following weeks after where like I'd be really good for half an hour and I'd be chatting and I'd be doing this. Yeah. And then I'd go back to my room and be like, oh, like yeah this isn't good but everyone would see the me for that half an hour and go he's all right like he's, yeah. he's good but i really wasn't so that was probably the hard one being like i've got to stay in check i've got to really look after my body here i actually got to be honest and and say that i'm when i go back to my room i'm actually not feeling too good yeah. so that was probably the hardest part um because yeah i could probably easily put it on and act on when i was out in public but it was as soon as i got home or um, as soon as i wasn't doing anything that it hit me and be like yeah i'm just not myself i'm not ready for this yet yeah well it's good to yourself mate because it's it, you can fall in those traps of like just trying to please people and and do the right thing but yeah when it's your head like fuck i look back now and 
you know, you just can't be risking it. Like no. it's, a, it's a life long thing, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> and there's other yeah. more important things like 100%. golf and exactly. everything else that's, that's <laughs> happening. Um, cool. Let's just, just on that as well. Like you said, the confidence, getting your confidence back. And Angus Brayshaw was, was talking about this too, who's had a fair bit of stuff going with concussion and Paddy McCartan. Was it getting back like the confidence was it actually just getting back and getting into activities or did you do things like we we're talking before like emma murray with like mindfulness or or um you know visualization or did any of that sort of play a part in it yeah so that's sort of a lot of work i do now um mm. and probably did in the pre-season but at the time didn't do too much of um like while i was going through it like that was nearly too hard like that's just sort of the concentrate extent of things on it, yeah, like, yeah like that'd give me a headache and then like literally sleeping would fix everything (laughs) so it was in a pretty dark place but um yeah now that's a lot of work i do is um yeah a lot of breathing um yeah a lot of sort of visualization and and just sort of realizing that like i was probably unlucky last year like you're going to get little bits of luck throughout your career and you're going to get unlucky sometimes and unfortunately last year was um although it was a head injury it was pretty bad luck so um i just got to keep playing footy and if if unlucky things happen then they happen and i just got to deal with that so Mm. that's probably more the mindset around it now and sort of just accepting it for what it is and um yeah just doing what i can to to be confident for games love it you spoke about just that breathing and visualization then is there one what's your favorite type um thing that you do i do a lot of breathing in terms of box breathing and stuff or like a just like trying to regulate sounds emotions. funny when you say you do a lot of breathing yeah. like, <laughs> so, so do we all yeah. <laughs> well, I, I like no, to think I breathe <laughs> I do like a lot of um, in origin camp a few years ago um, one of the guys come in and taught us I think it might be a bit of Wim Hof stuff but oh, yeah. it's about the like if I'm too hyped up six seconds in pause six seconds out think of the colour light blue if I need to build a bit more energy do the same thing but think of the colour red and just a lot wow. of those sort of things so um i've been sort of doing that when i need to regulate an emotion or get to that sort of point but um in the morning or uh, before i go to bed it's just that thing six seconds in six seconds out and i just find gradually you uh, like i remember when someone first taught me about it they said you'll start like thoughts in your head will go and you'll just start feeling different parts of your body and i thought this is ridiculous and i probably did it for a year before i realized like i'm probably only realizing it now that oh like when i actually do that i don't think about anything else i literally feel like tingles in my fingers and in my arms and um i feel like that's a level where i want to be at so i don't want to stop doing it yeah um but i feel like that sort of stuff ties in with um just make sure you're not stressing 24 7 you sort of bring yourself back to a calmer state and um yeah that's sort of probably been my bigger focus in terms of the the breathing sense of um things the past yeah 12 months that's fucking i've never heard of the the red and blue stuff before yeah i i remember once when i was playing footy i kept doing like my calf all the time and the psych at the club we did a a similar thing but he was saying the color white so like when you have like injury you sort of like uh, injury or there's a body like white you know promotes um blood so oh, like true. light like yeah. light promotes blood so like if you've got like a cork or anything like you just breathe into that spot and like feel like this light of white is just flushing through it it was really cool yeah yeah it's really right. cool wish i knew that i yeah. had so many hammy problems when i was a kid yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> i reckon so if they did they do those like little afl what do they do before a draft do they like scan your body and they do all yeah. those of things so yeah. like, that's probably another thing i know we're pretty far past no nah, definitely yeah like if they scanned my body when i was coming through the draft in the nrl i would have just been kicked to the curb like my hammies were cooked really? it wasn't until i come down here and like our sprint coach is an olympic sprint coach and brought me in like three four months earlier and just said we're doing this 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 we're changing your style we're doing this and like touch wood i haven't had any problems since mm. but like yeah it's crazy that's, oh, that's, it, that's no, no it is no you, you're so right like there's the, well, if you scanned anyone though everyone's got shit wrong with them mm. and i think it's that's what i saying before about the whole difference of league and union uh league and um afl sorry like there's so many different mod like ways of doing things and you could probably find benefits in both of them like i think that the thing that the afl does really well just on top of the league is the and and you're doing it yourself already is just like that support off field yeah he's been like is really really good Mm. but um yeah the draft stuff's rattling like i don't think until i moved to sydney i had no idea that you know there was no drafts there was academy suppliers you know the whole like you can leave one year out even you know going back again the deli m yeah so that for example a brownlow medal mm. that is judged at the end of the year and the votes are read out no one knows where people are standing but from chatting to das and yourself 
like that is it right that that is yeah, read so out to you explain it it's, it's so, so it's also picked a bit like the afl is by the umpires correct yeah which is weird yeah so yeah. i think the nrl allocate like i think it's ex players or um media even mm. people to sort of pick a three two one after a game and um i think after around 12 or 13 it goes behind doors behind so closed doors up till halfway through the year you, you know where you see the leaderboard yeah wow yeah, so um, yeah, pick differently and also you can sort of see it up until it's a certain point. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, so you have people like sitting there like predicting who's going to get it. And How many points ahead are you at the moment? Uh, I think I'm 15 and the next 12. So yeah, it's not much. But who's who's behind you? Um, Don't care. He's a loser. I hate him. One of the... Isaiah Yo he plays for the Panthers and Mitch Moses plays for the Eels. There you go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do you like the Panthers? Yeah. The Western Sydney boy myself. Hey, <laughs> let's get into some off-field stuff, mate, because this is where your story gets unbelievably exciting. Firstly, on the mindfulness chat as well, golf. <laughs> We could do a whole episode on this, but oh, we we've could. been bonding over this for a while. We haven't had a game yet. Um, I'm still just refining my swing pattern, as I was showing you earlier in the studio. <laughs> I'm just coming yeah, a little bit more, a little bit more into out, a little bit more wrist action coming right. over through the swing. Into out, yeah, into yeah. out to hit like because I've been coming over the top, so I'm going a bit more into out to hit like to push it out right and then so bring you can it draw back it in. back. So I'm trying yeah. to draw it. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, got me. <laughs> so, um, how's your game going at the moment? When did this passion start, and how good are you? first sort of exposure to it was with my dad when i was a kid and we'd just go play up at a golf course and um didn't do much about it and it was probably wasn't until i was 17 or 18 where when i was in sydney year 11 and 12 um one of the golf courses around the area sort of gave the young members i think it was like 300 bucks to join this like grouse course it was hectic it was so good they paid you to join no 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 like you just paid 300 oh, wow. for 12 months Unbelievable. um so we, me and a mate joined and we go up every free, free period and, and play golf and um, that's where i got my first few lessons there and then it wasn't until I moved down to Melbourne that I thought I'll take it a bit more seriously and then joined up at Q a couple of years ago and obviously the COVID disruptions and everything didn't get to play there too often, but um, probably for eight or nine months now, I've been going hard at it and, and working really hard at my game and um, tried to keep the golf bug. I reckon that's one big thing is like you get the golf bug and you can have it for a little bit, but it only takes you a couple bad rounds to lose it. Yeah. And I've sort of feel like I've been through that little patch now where I've had my bad rounds and now I'm just trying to actually make it a bit of a routine. It's and a habit, yeah. It's a habit and um, something I really love. So, um, I think my GA is 10.5 at the moment. Wow. Um, so, yeah, trying to work down to, to single figures. And I, I've been there briefly, but I can't call myself a single figure handicapper yet with some of the scores that are in there. So, <laughs> it's um, it's a tough slog, but I like I just appreciate the game. I love the game and, um, yeah, just, just like you really. It's... Yeah. It's a bit of a passion now. It definitely is. There's a more green sponsorship partnership slash collaboration <laughs> coming soon as well for the vlog channel. So we're going to have to we get out and play a game. We love um, that. Favorite part of the, your game? What, what do you think is the best? Are you a big boy? Are you a big hitter? Or are you more uh, finesse? Because I'm more of a finisher myself. Yeah. Okay, I don't have the power, but you get me around. And like, a short game specialist. Yeah, yeah, short game specialist. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's so you what can I mean. have the power, mate. I can. No, uh, but that's it though. Like, yeah. Have you heard a thing called strokes gained? No. Have you got into that yet? No. <laughs> I'll wait till you get that bug. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm telling you. It'll be a different game altogether. But yeah. um, no, nah, strength's probably, I probably do hit a long ball off the tee. Um, and then I've just tried to tempo my irons lately. So they don't go as long. 70% swing? 80%. Mm. Oh, you're still in 80%. Okay. I'm still yeah, 80%. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm on 70%. We're learning from the same guy, yeah. I think, as well. So this could be mixed signals here. Um, yeah, so working on that short game. Pretty much every practice session I got, I'll just go chip and putt now. Yeah. So um, speaking to a lot of people, they sort of said, to go from 10 to 4, which is the goal. Yeah. Just your short game. It's all finishing, isn't it? Yeah. Just bump it around, put it up there. Yeah. Get it close. Don't three putt. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, what's your, I, This is weird. That I don't know. Let's make sure. But talk us through your, your iron set at the moment as well. What have you got? So I'm just curious. <laughs> I don't know if you would have heard of them before, but um, Tour Edge Exotics. Tour Edge Exotics? Tour Edge Exotics. So, interesting story. My first set of clubs were Tour Edge Exotics. Okay. Um, just got them because they were cheap. And, yeah. Um, yeah whatnot um and then sort of bought a set of pings didn't play for two years and then i've got a partnership with drummond now mm. um and drummond Shout out to ross funny yeah well, ross funny what a champion sorts, he what a sorts great everyone bloke. out the ross guy if Absolute you don't play champion. golf in melbourne you don't know ross funny no. you're absolutely you're a nobody so yep. shout out to him. my love of golf his podcast as well oh, great podcast yeah drummond melbourne yeah yep. city store <laughs> go in and visit him um <laughs> no nah, so i i pretty much got a partnership with them and um 
wanted to try blades. Yeah. And which for those of, listening is like a very thin golf line. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's there's not as much forgiveness. However, they're a bit lighter. I really like the feel, like, and the challenge of really small sweet spots they're trying to hit it so went in there um just said to ross like looking for blades what can we do he's like oh well tour edge is sort of drummond's brand and mm. i was like oh no way that's my first set of clubs I ever had so he put me into them and um they're yeah, pretty happy with them so no. <laughs> that's that's what i've got uh, i've got a what have i got four down to pitching wedge and then this is the real topical one yeah what wedges do you carry i go 60 56 50 60 56 50 yeah right yeah yeah so i'm 50 60 54 yeah so yeah it's quite similar same, there's a two degree there. differential there that's why we, that's why i hit 70 and you hit 80 because there's a little, <laughs> little bit of a differential <laughs> um do you want to hear mine talk to me okay did you just get a new set i've got a new set callaway to shout out to michael, michael gorn <laughs> out there callaway. we love callaway on the show um for i've got a 60 56 50 the jaws callaway irons beautiful yep. and then i've got a four iron to pitching wedge but my four iron is a driving iron me too the, the yeah, yeah. The black shaft oh it's the best yep, it's honestly it. the best in the world <laughs> then i've got a five or three wood driver anyway let's get off that because it's um it's getting there but we will get you we'll save it for more greens yeah we'll save it for more greens and we'll get out there and, and have a game very very soon down at our local latrobe that's which it. is the Shout best out. course in australia <laughs> um business wise mate dead diamond society nft so firstly crypto you're massively into this i love my crypto i'm not really like as well versed in the nft space mm-hmm. but i've always been a really big fan of cryptocurrency like what how did you get involved with that and what is dead diamond society um so yeah it's the cryptocurrency sort of probably started um through a couple of the guys at the club and um a couple of guys i sort of respect and um would sort of take feedback on or um yeah sort of look at them as mentors and they sort of dabbled in it and um to be fair like i know a little bit but i still got so much to learn from Mm. it and that's sort of why i got into it was to sort of learn and have a little bit here and there and see what happens with it but not be too connected to it um but then the whole nft thing come about dead diamond society was through um so we got a business called four point collectibles and um, we do sort of sports cards memorabilia and um a bit of things around pop culture and um just things like that so So it's just like collectibles like as in like baseball basketball cards like footy cards anything you want yeah and for the yeah like obviously you're in that space you know how um lucrative it is but this is crazy there's crazy like the things. biggest niche in this if you're into like collectibles it's unbelievable yeah. like you'll do live drops of like yeah cards like picking them out and people yeah. watching it yeah so we like that's probably like when i speak about i play my best footy when i'm occupied and and doing other things off field throughout the bubble two years ago was when the card market boomed like mm. it was gary v gary v everything he says turns to gold um yeah so we sort of started our business through covid pretty much traveled with all these boxes on the road and um we was up at twin waters and <clears throat> excuse me um we pretty much had these boxes and we'd all huddle into one room at one night and go on a live and 200 people be tuning in mm. just for us to break cards for them and um it started there um and then we sort of threw one of the guys it's just a few of the storm boys it's there's four of us and um we sort of just did that um card markets died down a little bit since then so uh, we moved into the nft space with four other companies and um, one's a tech company one's a merchandise company and the other is an events company so mm. it was just four businesses that we thought would really work to provide utility for an nft and and my first exposure to nft was it's just artwork like people are just buying artwork and i wasn't too into it until i sort of dived in and sort of saw what you could do with it and um that's all we did we created dead diamond society through these four businesses and um we thought what better way to do it to get people into an nft by pretty much having it like an index fund for an nft so um no one's going to be able to afford a board ape i don't know if you've heard yep. of a board ape yep. or and, and give us an indication of how much that would be like what, uh, how much ethereum 100 eth 100 ETH, which, which is, would be like 300 grand or something. yeah 400k nearly so okay, cool. no one's going to go out and buy one of them um Unless you're Cameron Munster and you've got lots of money. <laughs> but um, no, like we thought if we buy a handful of blue chip NFTs um, and offer utility through our four businesses, let's have that as people's first exposure to an NFT. So we sold out in 11 minutes. Wow. Um, pretty many? crazy. 2,000? 2,000 NFTs. Um, they were 0.15 ETH each to mint. 
So I think we ended up dragging in about two mil in about eleven minutes. So <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah. So one and a half each is that, is that like fifteen hundred dollars each? So point one five would have been maybe five hundred, six hundred bucks okay. US. Yep. So US, so yeah. Thousand bucks, yeah. yeah. Um so we sort of did that and um it's crazy because there's so many projects out there that like like we sold out in 11 minutes like we knew what we were doing and we knew sort of Holy we had shit. this and what utility we're offering but there's projects that go out there and don't know what they're doing so like there's this thing called a rug pull where people make a project it's a fake project they just take the two mil and run mm. and we were like well we're not doing that like that's we pretty much got into this to teach people about nfts and and try to be a good 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 influence on like the australian market and um so we've done that and been going really good since um we got valued the other day um about 1.4 mil so it's unbelievable it's pretty insane sort of where we're at um and that's without offering the utility we've done so we'll do like meetups after the magic round in a few weeks yeah. and with um, those nft sorry as well are you is it are you offering just the artwork or is it an experience as well or so like? each each skull yeah is is the artwork um is 0.04 percent Yep. so the more you own um eventually down the track we want to be able to um offer dividends to skull holders yep. so the whole purpose of this nft was to, it's called a dow which yep. means um simple terms everyone has a vote on what you do yeah so however many skulls you own whatever our next action is we'll put a poll up and yeah, you vote so, yeah, yep yeah so yeah. like the people sort of decide what we're doing what we want to do with the money if you want to sell an nft uh, if we want to invest in something else and it's just a cool little community where we, cool. we do that so um and on top of that like the hour group who we partner with and they they they've got Shaq, shaquille o'neal coming down yep. and um like, there's meet and greets for that there's all the different things for um utilities within inside the nft so apart from owning a share in a board ape and said run horses and um, land in the sandbox in the metaverse and all that sort of thing there's also this per, like physical utility that yeah. comes with it so yeah i love the experience part of it yeah too, and that's where we want to do something here like you know when we we've we'd never just push something out that we're not like 100 yeah. confident mm -hmm. in and, and as i said it's all about community but i would want to make it more about the experience piece as well like obviously the artwork but then like you know being a part like coming on on the show or yeah. you know like do it designing your own bit of merch like shit like that like that you can actually like get a community around yeah and that's that was sort of a lot of the angle like we probably thought for 12 months of making nft but nothing ever like we just didn't think anything would ever like nothing really stood out yeah whereas this once like four other companies come around yeah, us and we're cool. like wow well, we've got something we can really do here and we can offer this 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 we can buy this 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 um and it was like let's do it so our whole mention the whole way through was um under promise over deliver yeah love that and that's, I mean, my that's life the way motto. to go forward yeah <laughs> that's, my, that's my life motto honestly love that um <laughs> it's one really cool argument on the the whole nft space as well that i love and it probably doesn't relate as much to dead diamonds well it actually it does but you know how people say like oh it's an nft like i could just print that off and put it in my um my lounge room it's yep. like yes <laughs> you could do that you could actually do that with the mona lisa as well and put like the mona lisa in your house mm -hmm. but where nfts are different and i'm telling you this you already know this it's more speaking to everyone no, else that he's arguing like it, it. it's yeah. where everyone else doesn't get it there's actually like a blockchain where you can actually see who the owner is of that piece of artwork yep. where with paintings like there could be fake paintings all over the world you don't know who actually owns that yeah like there, there's nowhere it is so by their argument of saying you could do that you're actually can of acting their own argument and fucking it up which is actually quite interesting yeah no, you know it on the head and it's like there's actually a place that you can go check it so like you know who's got yeah, it yeah you know you who's know. got it yeah and i think social media now as well um because you could have easily made it your profile picture before um mm. but now there's like a verification process you have to go through and yeah right um if it's not yours it'll become come up blurry and all that sort of thing is that right yeah, yeah. so what's up through instagram and stuff twitter or? mainly yeah i think instagram is still working through it um but yeah, twitter, twitter was on the front foot pretty early that's interesting yeah yeah fuck so they're really like if if you weren't sold on crypto now like you really need to get over that because it's <laughs> like it's unfortunately it is going to be here to stay like yep. it's 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 seriously there which is cool i need to really upskill myself on that <laughs> hey what's um what's next for you man you're doing so much I'm excited um for it. I'm yeah excited more, greens. <laughs> more greens obviously yeah. um <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. I've obviously got a lot on my plate at the moment um, and really sort of happy with the way things are going, but um, probably want to do more things for myself. Like I'm obviously looking for a house at the moment, mm. a bit of property. I sort of want to get into that market. And Melbourne? Melbourne. Um, Where do you just like to sort of get something. giving the address away? Like is there any <laughs> areas that you're keen on? Uh, the 3121, it's hard to go by. Oh, you like the Richmond? Love Richmond. Yeah. Love Richmond. Um, pretty simple guy. So like just a little apartment or something. Yep. 
Um, look down Bayside, but I just like being close to training. So that's sort of... You, know, you can come Northside if you want. You can fit in over Northside. No, Bayside. No, I'm saying you could fit in Northside. Oh, where's Northside? Northside, Fitzroy, Northgate. Oh, on. really? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, nah, I'm not really that vibe, <laughs> eh? Come on, man. Come on, man. <laughs> nah, I'm more around here. So yeah, that's, that's sort of... So you want to be like everyone else. Yeah, that's cool. Actually, if you want to do that, yeah, that's actually sick. Material girl, yeah. I call it. Yeah, that's me. Um, yeah, so that's sort of my next sort of step um just working through that and i just want to make smart decisions and i think sort of everything revolves around like a life after footy and, and yeah. being really comfortable and, and doing what i want to be able to do so um yeah, everything sort of systems go at the moment but um yeah looking forward I'd like, like to have a few more um properties and um successful businesses and be able to play golf every morning that'd be ideal Man, i love that we've missed about six year businesses which is obviously <laughs> crazy but we're gonna have to do a part two episode, mate. I'd love to have you as a part of the community. Loved having you in finally day to meet in person. But um, yeah, just love everything you're doing. Love the way you go about it. You're a fucking just a go getter, which is is cool. I love it. I respect it, and um, look forward to a long, long life of friendship between you and I. Beautiful. Be Plenty good. games of golf there. Plenty of games sure. of golf. Get uh, down thanks, Dylan. Appreciate it. Appreciate, it, brother. Good fun. Thank you.